Hey everyone this morning, uh, I'm thankful that you uh, came here to worship and thank you for letting me worship him with you. I encourage you to take out your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, not the passage on the screen, we'll go there in just a second. Looking over this sermon uh, the past two days, I realize I have no time to spare. So I do plan that you can get to lunch for a reasonable hour. That's my goal and my aim. But Lord willing, we're going to see what happens. Uh, but I think this is going to be beneficial to you, and this is a sermon I'm really excited about, and I hope you can share that enthusiasm as I kind of explain what I want to talk to, share with you this morning. Luke 8. This is Jesus telling the parable of scattering the seed, or the sower and the seed, right? Look in Luke 8, verse 4. Jesus says, And when a great multitude had gathered, they had come to him from every city. He spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and soon it sprang up, and it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears, let him hear. Here a very famous parable maybe some of us have studied before. Jesus making the point that the sower that goes out to sow this seed is like himself sharing the gospel or giving his gospel, the seed being the word of God. And he goes into different soils and he throws the seed. Everyone gets the gospel. But depending on the type of soil is the way the gospel is going to work in that area. And we can make an easy comparison, and Jesus does in just a second, that soil is like men's hearts or women's hearts. And the gospel goes into their heart. The seed is given. The word of God is given. But depending on their heart is if that gospel is going to grow and multiply or not, right? You have the first instance that you have some seed that's thrown by the wayside, but before anything can happen, birds of the air come and devour it. Secondly, you have seed that falls on the rock. It springs up really fast. It looks like it's going to be okay. But since it springs up so fast and because of where it was at, it withered up and died because of lack of water. Thirdly, we have some that fall on thorns. The thorns grow and they choke up the growth of the plant. There's nothing there left. But finally, fourthly, we have good ground. And that good ground is ready to receive the word of God with all readiness and gladness. And it takes it and it grows and it multiplies. Right. So we have that gospel story here. A story of the gospel basically here. This is something that I was studying with someone on Monday. Then on Tuesday, I studied something different. I studied Acts 17. I encourage you to get a piece of paper or a marker and put it here in Luke 8, because we're going to come back and flip back to Jesus' explanation back and forth. Keep a marker there, but look at Acts 17. In Acts 17 and 18, we have Jesus Christ sowing the seed through Paul and Silas to four different cities. To four different cities here. In Acts 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica, then he goes to Berea, and then he goes to Athens. And then in 18, he goes to Corinth. And as I want to kind of reveal, and as we go over this morning, you will see the types of soil talked about in Luke 8 in a real-life scenario in Acts 17 and 18. So I thought this was really interesting, and studying both of these things, if you put them together, there's a lot of great deal of harmony in the lessons that come from both of these passages. Now, it would have been wonderful if it was perfect. i got four cities, i got four types of soil. It would be wonderful if they worked like, you know, okay, one city, and this was this soil, one city, and this soil. However, the soils weren't about cities. The soils were about individuals. And a bunch of individuals it takes to make a city. So in all these different cities, you'll sometimes see all four types of soil. And so what I'd like to do with you this morning is go through Acts 17 and 18. We're not going to read everything, but we're going to tell the whole story. And talk about how the gospel reacted in these different locations because of the different people that lived there. I think there's a lot to glean from this. Let's kind of give you an outline and know where we're going and where we're heading with this. Here, Paul and Silas are on their second missionary journey. Well, Paul's second. He picked up Silas for this one. Second missionary journey, and Paul gets what we call the Macedonian call. And so what he does is he travels to Macedon, which is north of Greece. And he starts doing some teachings there. The big prominent city in Macedonia is Philippi. And here in chapter 16, he converted Lydia by the river, and he converted the Philippian jailer. Now it's time for Paul to get into what we call Greece today. And it would have been called Greece back then too by the Romans. But mainly what the Romans did was sort these areas into counties. So you'll see both of these words so we're familiar with our terms as we read Acts. 
We have Macedonia up here where Paul's going through. Here's Philippi where he convinces converts the Philippian jailer and Lydia. He goes back to Lydia's house and stays there and moves on to these two cities. This city right here is in 17 verse 1. I will not be reading the name of that city and I will not be reading that verse because of that city. I've never been able to say it and I'm not going to try to right now. He goes to these two cities in Greece, but our story really picks up in Thessalonica. And that's the first city we're going to look at. He goes to Thessalonica, and I've called these people the persuaders because they were persuaded very quickly by the scattering of the seed. They hear the gospel. They accept it very quickly. The next city he goes to is Berea, right here, the second city in Greece. Then, after going to Berea, he goes to Athens. And here in Athens, Luke records the sermon that he gives on Mars Hill in Athens. And then finally, our story ends in Corinth was the last city that he meets in Greece that he spends a year and a half here. Now, he does go to Centuria. However, there's not a lot said about Centuria, and that four sounded a lot better than five points. So we're going to do the four cities that Paul scattered the gospel in Greece. This is like Paul's Greek tour. He's going to go through Greece. He's going to scatter the gospel, scatter the seed, and we're going to see what happens. So let's look here beginning first in Thessalonica. And I've labeled these the persuaded. This was a soil that was ready and eager to hear the word of God, but grew very quickly. And it didn't take a long time at all for these people to be convinced of the gospel. In Acts 17, verse 2, after coming to Thessalonica, Paul goes into the synagogue. It says in verse 2, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews were not persuaded, they became envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So they go and they look for Paul at Jason's house. They can't find him. They drag Jason out instead. They try to prosecute him at the courts. However, after giving money, they free him, and Paul, in the meantime, is able to escape to Berea. And Thessalonica here, as we see the story goes out, Paul has a tradition. And he has a custom, and it starts here in Acts 17. Paul, when he came to a city to evangelize, he was always looking for the place where God's people already met, where people that generally cared about God met. You go in Acts 16, he goes to the riverside to meet Lydia, because that's where people, God-fearing women, came together to read God's word and to pray together. So he was looking for people that already were interested in God to be the first people he showed the gospel to. He becomes a tradition here that every time he goes into a city, he's going to go to the synagogue first, and he's going to try to meet with God's people and teach them about the Christ. And all of these cities we're going to go to, he does this every time. First, he goes to the synagogue where the Jews met. And so when we think about being evangelists today, and most of this I want to take from our own personal effects of the gospel affecting our heart, but every once in a while we'll go talk about the other end of it, being the evangelist ourselves Are we going to the places where people already care about God to teach them? Are we first finding people who care about God and seem to be interested to start our mission to evangelize? Hopefully we are. In Gardendale, and I know as a community, this is kind of difficult to do. Because there's not really a community place where people meet here to talk about things about God. There's not really a community place where people go to to just talk in general. The only coffee shop we have here where people meet up and spend time together and maybe talk a little bit, is Starbucks. You know, awful coffee for a lot of money. And a lot of situations when you go into a place like that, are people going to be wanting to talk to you? That's not the way we work as a community or a society. And that's not necessarily a good thing, that we're not willing to talk to people on the street. However, I do believe we have neighbors and we have friends and coworkers that are interested about God. Have we taken the opportunity or have we made a tradition to go to those people first? First step out there. Hey, would you like to get together and talk about God some? I know you're interested in him. Can, can we talk? Can we talk about Jesus? 
Because this is what Paul did, and evidently Paul was given the opportunities to speak at these places. They welcomed him at first. We see that he goes into the synagogue and he reasoned with them from the scriptures for three Sabbaths. For three Sabbaths. We can take this two ways. One, we see here how long he stayed. How long did he stay? If three Sabbaths are three Saturdays, well then he stayed there three weeks. And I don't know if this means that he reasoned in the synagogue every day for those three weeks. Or that means he only reasoned in the synagogue on every Saturday of those three weeks. I'm not sure the way it goes. But it's not a lot of time. It's not a lot of time to do some teaching. However, Paul was able to get a lot done. And many believed. He explained to them in verse 3 that Christ had to suffer. Then he had to rise again from the dead. And that Messiah, the Christ that had to suffer and rise again dead, he was Jesus Christ. Who believed, though, in this situation? Some of the Jews believe, but predominantly it's who? It's the Greeks. And I want to save this for just a little bit when we go to Corinth. But if you'll notice, usually the first people that you take that step forward to convert, those people that you try the hardest to convert first, sometimes those aren't the ones you actually convert. Sometimes it's the people you meet second or the people that overhear the conversation and ask more. And you see that with this soil here. What happens at the end of Thessalonica is persecution becomes. Uh, Envious Jews in verse 5 hear about this, they're upset about this, so they go into the marketplace, they find evil men, they stir them up to leave this prosecution against the Jews between the ruling council. The ruling council kind of throw it out and they take money and I guess take a bribe or, or some type of loan like that. However, it ends up being resolved itself. What kind of soils in Luke 8 go along with Thessalonica? I think a lot of them do. If you look back in Luke 8, Let's look at Jesus' explanation here. And after I read these, I'll just be able to reference them quickly. But back in Luke 8, if you had it marked, this is what Jesus said in verse 12. Those that by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Why do you think persecution happens so fast after only being three weeks there in Thessalonica? I think Jesus tells us the answer in Luke 8, 12. It seems like de- the devil, like the birds in the parable, came to quickly hush it up, stop the movement, and take the gospel before it was really being able to plan. Now, thankfully, he did not succeed for everyone. We're given the evidence that the church at Thessalonica was able to grow and thrive looking at epistles. Verse 13 works as well, possibly for the Thessalonians. But one on the rock are those who, when they hear... Receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. At least we can see that Satan himself was trying to cause this to be the situation at Thessalonica. These people were converted quick. Three weeks. That's fast. And I know a lot of them already believe in Greeks and a lot of believing Jews, and they're just having to transfer into the new program, the new system, the new law. However, that's really quick to learn something like that, right? What's the danger with learning something like the gospel so quick and being persuaded so easily and so quick? Well, as soon as temptation comes, you might give up on it, right? Might give up on it really quickly, like we see in verse 13. Go back to Acts 17. As we're turning there, just something to think about. It is awesome when people are persuaded very quickly to the gospel. And I don't want to shy away from that or say that that's wrong to do that at all. It's wonderful when you have a heart that's so pure and open. They say, I I love this. I love Jesus. I want to be a part of this life. What do I need to do? That's a great attitude to have. Especially when it's faster, it makes it nicer and easier. But when we see these things happen to other people, or we see that situation either with ourselves, one thing we need to be on the lookout for is temptation. Because if Satan sees you grow so fast, he's like, well, you know what? Maybe I can send a bird real quick to get that seed out of there. Or maybe I can send the sun out and wither it up and dry it out. Something to think about as we go into this. That we need to be careful not to let something like persecution get in our way as we go about like the Thessalonians and be persuaded. Let's go to Berea now. Having to sink away, Paul and Silas go to Berea in verse 10. Verse 10 says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. Why did Paul and Silas go to the synagogue of Jews? 
because it was their custom, right? They went first to the people that they knew feared God, at least to some kind of degree. Verse 11, these who were more far-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, that means a lot of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul and Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren were sent away to go to sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with speed, and they departed. Now here Paul moves to Berea. In Berea he goes to the synagogue, and we meet some really interesting people. The Bereans here, Luke says about them that they were fair-minded in my version. Some of y'all using maybe older version will say they were more noble-minded or noble. Uh, isn't that the, the name of our program, the Noble Searcher, right? It comes from the Bereans. And so it's a really popular verse, and it's a very good. It's something that we want to imitate and be like. If you look up fair-minded or noble, some of you may in your versions have, have open-minded. It seems to me one word that fits all of these things is reasonable. They were very open to the idea of God being preached to them. And they were noble and they were reasonable. And they're saying, no, Paul, if you'd like an opportunity to talk to us about this gospel, we want to hear it. Now, sometimes I think we're a little afraid of using the word open-minded. Uh, usually we use the word open-minded to talk about sin today. And we'll say, well, they're a little bit more open-minded than I am about that sort of things." So or when someone's trying to get you to sin, they say, you just need to be more open-minded. We'll use that in a negative sense. But I think here in this sense of fair-mindedness or noble-mindedness or open-mindedness in the sense of reasonable, it can be a really, really good thing in the proper context. I'm willing to hear you out. I'm willing to hear your message. I'm willing to hear something new as long as it's in the Holy Scriptures. And we'll move to that in just a second. We see secondly, though, before I get to the Scriptures, they were ready. It said they received the word with all readiness in verse 11. They were ready to hear the gospel. Their heart was ready to hear the gospel. Probably you know, a lot of y'all know where I'm about to tell you to turn. Go back to Luke 8. The Bereans were ready. They were noble-minded. They wanted to hear the gospel. Back in Luke 8, if you look in verse 15. Jesus says this about that final soil. He says, But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Right? Does that sound like the Bereans? I think that sounds exactly like the Bereans. If you think about this, are we ready to hear the gospel? Are we ready to make those changes in our life? It's something that we are willing and wanting to do. If you think about some of you that still go to school, when you go to English class, are you ready to hear about English? Are you ready to be part of that Bible class? Some of y'all right now are shaking your heads no, and now your parents are looking around to see who's shaking their head no. <laughs> if you notice something about school or about work or some type of learning activity, often you've got to prepare yourself to hear that information. And you've got to come in with a certain attitude. Okay, this is something that's important. This is something that's going to help me. I need to pay attention and listen to this out. I need to be ready to hear these things. Now, even though I think English is very important, a lot of English teachers here, you do an important job, don't you? But I think everyone here will also agree with me that ready to hear the gospel is more important than ready to hear about English. And so if we're going to use those principles in our daily life, are we using them here? We come to Bible class, are we ready for Bible class? Did you do your lesson? Did you at least read the chapter we're going to cover beforehand? Did you come here with just enough time, not running in so late that you miss half the class? Or are you seated and you're ready to go and you got your Bible out? Are you actually ready? Or is it just a last minute thing? Because if you prepare your heart to get ready for the gospel, you're going to be able to take more in and you're able to be able to do more with it. When we study with someone, are we ready to study with someone like that? Are we ready to receive the word of God? When we do preaching, are we ready to hear a sermon about the gospel? Hopefully we are, and if we do, we'll be better for it. 
These two things hinge on a very important thing said about the Bereans. The Bereans, they were diligent to search the scriptures daily to make sure the things that we're saying were so. This is why I said about open-mindedness. Usually we say something that open-mindedness is negative. However, it also can be very positive as long as we're willing to do the effort and to do the research, right? To put the effort and to be hardworking to take responsibility before our position with God. We're going back to talk about somebody, the Athenians, just a second, where new things were a bad thing for them. But I do believe that as Christians, we always need to be open-minded towards God. Then I understand a lot of us have been Christians for a long time. Maybe some of us, our families, have been Christians for generations. However, can God still teach you something new for you through the Word of God? Absolutely. Now, it wasn't new. It's an old thing. It's something God wrote a long time ago. But it might be new to you. Are we ready to change our mind, change our position, change things because the Word of God revealed something to us new? Hopefully we are. And if we are open-minded in that respect and we're ready to receive the gospel, we can call ourselves noble-minded, right? If you remember back in Luke 8, 15, God said one thing less about the the good soil. He says they were patient. How long is it going to take to search the scriptures daily? Well, that's going to take every day, right? Search the scriptures daily. What is that going to require? That's going to require some patience. And I think sometimes in this world with the internet, we want answers now, don't we? I want to Google it, I want to answer. I want to Google it, I want to answer. But when it comes to this and it comes to our own soul, sometimes those answers take a little while. And we have to have that daily patience and that daily work ethic to study the scriptures and to learn what God wants us to know about his gospel. Right? This is obviously the good soil here in Berea, uh, through and through. Eventually those from Thessalonica catch up to the Bereans. And the Jews cause trouble there. And Paul is sent by a ship to Athens. And then once we're getting in Athens, he calls for Silas and Timothy to come and meet him. While they get there in verse 16 in Athens, we meet the philosophers. But first, as Paul's custom, where does he go first? He goes to the synagogue. It says in verse 16, Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and the marketplace with those who happen to be there. Here first, when he gets to the city, he is provoked in his spirit. What is he provoked about? He's provoked that the city has been given over to idols. It's like they got the city and they gave it to all these idols. The idols are just overrun. You notice here, you think Paul was provoked in his spirit in a happy way? I think he was pretty angry about this. And I think Paul was very sensitive to the fact that there was these idols here in Athens. And to kind of talk about go a little branch off, I think Paul here is showing that that fourth type of soil, that good ground that's tender and malleable, is Paul's own heart. Because it upset Paul when he saw sin on this scale. Right? It upset his heart. And I just wanted to remind all of us, do we still allow things like that to provoke our spirit? You know, we see some kind of injustice. We see sin, especially on a large scale. We see sin in someone we love. Does that provoke our spirit? Hopefully it does. And I just would think that if we get to the point where that's not happening anymore, there might be a heart problem. There might be a soil problem. Now, Paul doesn't take this so far that he becomes anxious or scared. He doesn't go that direction with this, right? He's not so anxious about it he can't fall asleep. That's when we have to rely on God's justice and his promises in those situations. However, it does bother him. And when it bothers him, what does he do? He springs into action, right? Something bothers him, and so he sees it as a teaching opportunity. He's able to go to the synagogue, he's able to go to the Greeks, and eventually he goes to the marketplace, and he meets these philosophers. It says here, the next verse that we didn't read, turn too far, verse 18, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and said... What does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he's preached them Jesus and the resurrection. So they ask him to come to Mars Hill and to speak. What we'll see is as he goes and he gives the sermon in 22 through 33. Excuse me, 34, 32. Let me say it again. 22 through 32. Those verses in Acts 17. And I don't have time to read the sermon. 
But in my opinion, my opinion, this is the most beautiful sermon Paul ever wrote. I, I think in my mind, this is the best. This is the best one he did. And this is just opinion, but it's an absolutely beautiful sermon. He gives it. He says some very important things. He talks about how God is the creator of all. We all owe him something. God doesn't worship, excuse me, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's too big for that. But verse 27, he says this. He says, so this was God's mission that they should seek the Lord and hope that he might grope for them and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Meaning that even though you have these Athenians who don't know anything about God and don't know anything about the resurrection. However, God desires for them to find him because he's not far from them, is he? If you remember this story, how does this sermon play out? They laugh at him and they mock at him, especially when he brings up the resurrection. We have here the Athens philosophers, smartest people of their time. You always read about Socrates or Plato. Maybe it's something you learned in English class or history class. Guys who kind of wrote the book on Western civilization. You'll go into social studies class and they'll talk about our republic and democracy. And they'll want to start in Athens, right? All these wonderful things we learned about from Athens. Most intelligent people they are. Yet how do they respond to the gospel? There's a few that follow. But ultimately they reject it. They reject it. Here... Even some of the most intelligent people of the world are going to mock and laugh at and ignore the gospel, aren't they? That bothers some of us. How do so many smart people reject the gospel? 1 Corinthians 1 gives us the answer. You see it on the screen. This is what Paul said. He says, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The gospel is designed in such a way that a prideful heart can't understand it. And if you're a Jew with a prideful heart and you don't want to set in your ways and you don't want to change, you don't want to be open-minded to the scriptures or to the gospel, Jesus then becomes a stumbling block. He's just something you trip over. When you're a Greek and you're proud of your wisdom and your intelligence, and that is your whole life to sit around and talk about something new, something you never heard about, you become prideful. And Jesus then is just foolishness. It doesn't make sense, and you just cast it out and you reject it. The problem here is not that they're intelligent. The problem here is their prideful hearts. And that's what I've always taken from this. And often when we credit these people with so much, they still rejected the gospel. Now, what's great about this, though, in this positive sense, even though these people rejected the gospel, the guarantee in this sermon is that God still wasn't far from them, was he? It was possible for these people, too, to obey the gospel. And some people did. He wasn't far from them. They just had to simply seek after him. A lot of situations, a lot of problems that are caused because of this. In my mind, I really like some very smart people and intelligent people in the world, but it just boggles my mind that they would reject the gospel. But what we need is not intelligence per se. What we need is good, open hearts that are willing to put the effort into this. Let's finally go to Corinth. Corinth, our fourth and last city. And I nicknamed them the Blasphemers. We kind of hit the worst group here at the end. But a lot of great things happen after. In Corinth, verse 1 of chapter 18 says this. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who's recently come to Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded the Jews to be depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for my occupation. They were tent makers. For, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Paul, compelled by the Spirit, and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed baptized. And then we end the story. The Holy Spirit tells Paul, you can stay here for a while. I'm going to preserve you and you can work with these people. He stays with them for a year and a half. 
The Jews who first see this, and the resurrection again is brought up, that Christ had to suffer, and that they end up blaspheming and rejecting it. It says that they opposed him when he said Jesus was the Christ in verse 6. They blaspheme and rejected God. The problem with rejection of God is that God is the only one that can provide you with salvation. And so if God's the only one that has salvation, and you reject God or reject Christ, where are you going to get salvation from? The answer is simple. You ain't going to get it. Because the only person who has it, you've turned away, you've rejected. It's a big, awful problem that they have here, that they would reject this message. We see as well as we go on that Paul decided to go teach the Gentiles. And he shakes his hands of them, and he goes and he decides to leave, right? He leaves the synagogue, and he walks out. And I absolutely love this. How far does he walk when he leaves the synagogue to go teach the Gentiles? If you look here in verse 7, the answer. He departed from there, and he entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. I hope you can appreciate this as much as I do. But you get to see Paul's personality here. He's with the synagogue. He's teaching. They reject him. They blaspheme Christ. He says, you know what? I'm going to go to someone who cares. He gets out. He walks out the door. And he walks next door. Hey, I heard you're God-fearing. Is there any way I can teach you about the gospel? Paul doesn't walk far at all, does he? He goes literally next door to where he was to find someone who's willing to listen. And he ends up finding good soil there. It ends up working. But even more amazing, look at verse 8. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with his whole household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Crispus, the very ruler of the synagogue, the one whom Paul just walked out of because they blasphemed God, came and believed and was baptized into Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And this is what the power of God can do, can it? It can take the ruler, the ruler of those that blaspheme, and he can take him and change him and make him a new person and make him better, right? Paul here uses what I call the car dealership tactic. Several times when I bought a used car, you know, and I offer, hey, $10,000, know, I'll pay $10,000 for it, and they say, no, I'm going to only take less than twelve. dollars I say, well, all I can do is ten. They go, well, I want twelve. So you know what I do? I start walking out the door. And you go and you put your hand on the doorknob. And then sometimes when you put the hand on the doorknob, you go, you know what, I'll do 10. (laughs) Because sometimes, even in those physical carnal situations, we have to walk away to solve a problem, don't we? Here with the Jews, he works with them, he labors with them, he tries his best. However, when he sees that's not working, he's got to go spend his time with someone who does care. And sometimes we do have to walk away from situations that aren't prevailing. You see a soil, it looks like good soil at first, but you find out it's hard as a rock. You can't do anything. You've tried everything. What do you got to do? Well, you got to go try to find some good soil, don't you? And this is what Paul does here. As I brought up with uh, the Philippian jailer and also we see in Thessalonica, that sometimes you'll try so hard with one person and it just doesn't work. But then you end up converting the person or working with the person that overheard the conversation. They didn't do anything like that. I had a friend who recently had a brother that asked him to go study with his mother. And he said, my mother, she's not a Christian. She's in hospice. And I really want her to become a Christian. And so he goes and he decides to go meet with her. And she's open to it. She can talk to him and they're able to study together. And the more and more he talks to her, she's just rejecting it. And from a sad situation, it didn't end up working out with her. She just kept on rejecting it. And that, that was her choice. They did everything they could. However, the hospice nurse asked if he'd go study with him some more. The nurse, the person that was just there listening, there to do her job. And yet the gospel was able to find her, wasn't it? And I think when we go out there and we start scattering this seed and we start doing what Jesus asked us to do, I think often we're going to be surprised where that plant, where that gospel ends up sprouting up from. Because sometimes we might be seeding this area as best we can, and all of a sudden over here it starts growing, doesn't it? And that's because as individuals we all have the power of choice, and we're all going to make our own choices to do that, right? And I saw that in this story, that you have four different types of soils all through these different cities. 
Paul did the best he could, and all we can do is do the best that we could. To sum things up, I'd like to look at this. What are some things that you saw in grace? Or things that you saw every time happen in every city? You go to the synagogue, a lot of good answers there we can pull out. I just want to leave you with two. Number one, in every single city I saw persecution. In every single city he gets basically driven out of, except for in Athens, where they just drive him out by laughing at him, right? Every city, they either try to break his bones or they try to break his heart. And I think we can take this from this lesson. Even though there was persecution for Paul, I think we can say assuredly that there's also going to be persecution for us. And maybe today we live in a society where they're not allowed to drag us out into the street. They're not allowed to go take us from court, even though that is starting to sometimes happen, right? But I think often the way I've been persecuted the most in my life is I have been laughed at. And more than anything, and I haven't experienced what these people experience. I really have no right to talk about this, but I hate, I hate being laughed at. I hate it. And I hate Jesus being laughed at, and I hate being mocked, and I hate being made fun of. However, everyone's got their own soil. Everyone's allowed to make choices, and they can make the choice to do this. And Satan can come like a bird and try to take that gospel out of my heart. However, I saw a theme in every single one of these cities, too. Something that was discussed, something that was talked out, something that the Athenians laughed at. There was a resurrection story in Greece. Something that was talked about often. Something that the Greeks really absolutely hated. The Sadducees got their whole concept of there is no resurrection from these people. Something that they practiced, they lived in, they weren't open-minded to the thought that there could be a resurrection. However, Paul proves that there is a resurrection. The Bereans could confirm with their study of the scriptures. Knowing that there was persecution and there will be persecution, there's something I can say about the resurrection too. There was a resurrection by Jesus Christ. And for us too, there will be a resurrection. And after the persecution, we get laughed at, we get mocked. It's all going to be worth it when he comes back, isn't it? It's all going to be worth it. Hopefully when he comes back, he's going to be able to call us up into the air because we're his people. He's going to give us new spiritual bodies, better than anything we've had here. And he's going to take us home to live with him forever. What I want to tell him when that happens is, Lord, I had your word and I scattered it everywhere. I scattered it everywhere. Lord, sometimes people's responded. Some people made fun of me. But it didn't matter now. Because you've come and you've made everything right. Thank you for all that you've done for me. That's something I'd love to tell Jesus when that happens. But I take this confidence from these lessons. Thank you for your close attention this morning. And hopefully you kind of saw my enthusiasm in that and why I thought that was so interesting to me. Uh, obviously the word of God, that's what it does for us. You know, it opens our hearts and opens our minds to something new. <laughs> I think of all the different cities, we can say something individuals about ourselves here right now. Some of us here this morning are persuaded, and I hope that's the truth. Some of here that they've heard the gospel, they've heard about what Jesus can do for them, and they're persuaded and they want to become a Christian. Or maybe they're persuaded to talk to the congregation about getting their life right. That just needs to happen. Well, I want to encourage you to act on that persuasion, and let's do something. There's some of us here, though, too, are blasphemers of God. Not because they are hurtful to God or because they, um, you know, said something mean about God. I think it's because they've rejected God. And the only reason why you don't have salvation is because you're rejecting the one person who can give you salvation. And that's a serious problem. However, like the Corinthians, you can change your mind, like perhaps Crispus did. And you can come and you can receive what God's trying to freely give you. There's some of us here that may be like the Bereans, and you're noble-minded, and you're reasonable. And you're thinking, you know what, Andrew, I haven't really heard enough to make a decision like that. Would you study with me? Absolutely, I will study with you. Sometimes my invitations end up like this a lot, but I just beg people to come and study with me, don't, don't I? My buddy Blair's here, came in as a roommate with him in Tuscaloosa. We plan on going and getting something to eat after for lunch, after church. However, if someone comes up to me, either you come forward or you come and talk to me in the foyer and say, Andrew, I'm a Berean. I want to study more about this. Me and Blair can grab a sandwich, can't we? And we'll just come back here and bring our sandwich and we'll study with you. Meet you in a house, wherever works for you. Because you're noble-minded. And as long as you're open-minded to the gospel, Jesus will come and he will save you. Through the power of his blood and through the washing of waters of baptism. If there's any way we can help you with that, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing.